Hi there, uh, we'll continue with chapter 2. If you remember, Toad and Mole were sitting planning the adventure and Rat was sat not quite so enthusiastic uh, wondering what was going to happen next. Well, let's find out. <clears throat> when they were quite ready, the now triumphant Toad led his companions to the paddock and set them to capture the old grey horse, who, without having been consulted, and to his extreme annoyance, had been told off by Toad for the dustiest job in this dusty expedition. He frankly preferred the paddock and took a great deal of catching. Meantime, Toad packed the locker still tighter with necess necessaries and hung nose bags, nest of onions, bundles of hay and baskets from the bottom of the cart. Alas, the horse was caught and harnessed, and they set off, all talking at once, each animal either trudging by the side of the cart or sitting on the shaft, as humour took him. It was a golden afternoon. The smell of dust they kicked up was rich and satisfying. Out of thick orchards on either side the road of the road, the birds called and whistled to them cheerily. Good-natured wayfarers passing them gave them a good day, or stopped to say nice things about their beautiful cart, and rabbits sitting at their front doors in the hedgerows held up four paws and said, Oh my, oh my, oh my. Late in the evening, tired and happy and miles from home, they drew up in a remote common far from habitations, turned the horse loose to graze and ate their simple supper, sitting on the grass by the side of the cart. Toad talked big about all he was going to do in the days to come, while the stars grew fuller and larger all around them, and a yellow moon, appearing suddenly and silently from nowhere in particular, came to keep them company and listen to their talk. At last they turned in to their little bunks in the cart, and Toad, kicking out his legs, sleepily said, "'Well, good night, you fellows. This is the real life for a gentleman. Talk about your old river.' "'I don't talk about my river,' replied the patient rat. "'You know I don't, Toad, but I think about it,' he added pathetically in a lower tone. "'I think about it all the time.' The mole reached out from under his blanket, fell for Rat's paw in the darkness, and gave it a squeeze. "'I'll do whatever you like, Ratty,' he whispered. "'Shall we run away tomorrow morning quite early, very early, and go back to our dear old hole in the river?' No, no, we'll see it out, whispered back the rat. Thanks awfully, but I ought to stick by Toad till this trip is ended. It won't be safe for him to be left by himself. It won't take very long. His fads never do. Good night. The end was indeed nearer than even Rat suspected. After so much open air and excitement, the Toad slept very soundly, and no amount of shaking could rouse him out of bed next morning. So the Mole and the Rat turned to... Quietly and manfully, and while the rat saw to the horse and lit a fire and cleaned last night's cups and platters and got things ready for breakfast, the mole trudged to the nearest village, a long way off for milk and eggs and various necessaries that the toad had, of course, forgotten to provide. The hard work had all been done, and the two animals were resting, thoroughly exhausted by the time toad appeared on the scene, fresh and gay, remarking what a pleasant, easy life it had been they were all leading now after the cares and worries and fatigues of the housekeeping at home. They had a pleasant ramble that day under the grassy downs and along the narrow by lanes and camped as before on a common. Only this time the two guests took care that Toad should do his fair share of the work. In consequence, when time came for starting next morning, Toad was by no means so rapturous about the simplicity of the primitive life and indeed attempted to resume his place in his bunk whence he was hauled out by force. Their way lay as before across country by narrow lanes, and it was not until the afternoon that they came out onto the high road. The first high road, and there disaster, fleet and unforeseen, sprang out on them. A disaster momentous indeed to their expedition, but simply overwhelming in its effect on the after career of Toad. They were strolling along the high road easily, the mole by the horse's head talking to him, since the horse had complained that he was being frightfully left out of it, and nobody considered him in the least. The toad and the water rat walking behind the cart, talking together, at least toad was talking, and rat was saying at intervals, yes, precisely, and what did you say to him? And thinking all the time of something very different, when far behind them they heard a faint warning hum, like the drone of a distant bee. 
Glancing back, they saw a small cloud of dust with a dark centre of energy advancing on them at an incredible speed, while from out of the dust a faint poop poop wailed like an uneasy animal in pain. Hardly regarding it, they turned to resume their conversation, when in an instant, as, as it seemed, the peaceful scene was changed with a blast of wind and a whirl of sound that made them jump for the nearest ditch. It was on them. The poop poop rang with a brazen shout in their ears. They had a moment glimpse of an interior of glittering plate glass and rich Morocco, and the magnificent motor car, immense, breath snatching, passionate, with its pilots tense and hugging the wheel, possessed all earth and air for a fraction of a se second, flung an enveloping cloud of dust that blinded and enwrapped them utterly, and then dwindled to a speck in the far distance, changed back into a droning bee once more once more. The old grey horse, dreaming as he plodded along of his quiet paddock, in a new raw situation such as this, simply abandoned himself to his natural emotions, rearing, plunging, backing steadily in spite of all the mole's efforts at his head and all the mole's, all the mole's lively language directed at his better feelings. He drove the car backwards towards the deep ditch at the side of the road. It wavered in an instant and there was a heart-rending crash and the canary-coloured cart, their pride and joy, lay on his side in the ditch, an irredeemable wreck. The rat danced up and down in the road, simply transported with passion. You villains, he shouted, shaking both fists. You scoundrels, you highwaymen, you, you road hogs. I have the law on you. I'll report you. I'll take you through all the courts. His homesickness had quite slipped away from him, and for that moment he was the skipper of the canary-coloured vessel driven on a shoal by the reckless jockeying of rival mariners, and he was trying to recollect all the fine and biting things he used to say to the masters of steam launches when their wash, as they drove too near the bank, used to flood his parlour carpet at home. Toad sat straight up in the middle of the dusty road, his legs stretched out before him, and stared fixedly in the direction of the disappearing motor car. He breathed short, his face wore a placid, satisfied expression, and at intervals he faintly murmured, Poop, poop. The mole was busy trying to quiet the horse, which he succeeded in doing after a time. Then he went to look at the cart on his side in the ditch. It was indeed a sorry sight. Panels and windows smashed, axles hopelessly bent, one wheel off, sardine, sardine tins scattered over the wide world, and the bird in the birdcage sobbing pitifully, and calling to be let out. The rat came to help him, but their united efforts were not sufficient to right the cart. Hi, Toad, they cried. Come and bear a hand, can't you? The Toad never answered a word or budged from his seat in the road. As they went to see what was the matter with him, they found him in a sort of trance, happy smile on his face, his eyes still fixed on the dusty wake of their destroyer. At intervals he was still heard to murmur, Poop, poop. The rat shook him on the, by the shoulder. Are you coming to help us, Toad? he demanded sternly. Glorious, stirring sight, murmured Toad, never offering to move. The poetry of motion, the real way to travel, the only way to travel here today, in next week tomorrow. Villagers skipped, towns and cities jumped, always somebody else's horizon. Oh, bliss, oh, poop, poop, oh my, oh my. Oh, stop being an ass, Toad, cried the mole despairingly. And to think I never knew, went on Toad in a dreamy monotone, all those wasted years that lie behind me, I never knew, never even dreamt, but now, but now I know, now that I've fully realised, oh, what a flowery track lies spread before me, henceforth, what dust clouds shall spring up behind me as I speed on my reckless way, what carts I shall fling carelessly into the ditch in the wake of my magnificent onset, horrid little carts, common carts, canary-coloured carts. "'What are we to do with him?' asked the mole of the water rat. "'Nothing at all,' replied the rat firmly, "'cause there is really nothing to be done. "'You see, I know him of old. "'He's now possessed. "'He has got a new craze, "'and it always takes him this way in its first stages. "'He'll continue like that for days now, "'like an animal wa walking in a happy dream, "'quite use useless for all practical purposes. "'Never mind. "'Let's go and see what there is to be done about the cart.' "'A careful inspection showed them that even if they succeeded in writing it by themselves, the cart would no longer travel. The axles were in a hopeless state, and the missing wheel was shattered into pieces. 
The rat knotted the horse's reins over his back and took him by the head, carrying the birdcage and its, hysteri- and its hysterical occupant in the other hand. Come on, he said grimly to the mole. It's five or six miles to the nearest town, and we shall just have to walk it. The sooner we make a start, the better. But what about Toad? asked the mole anxiously as they set off together. We can't leave him here, sitting in the middle of the road by himself, in the distracted state he's in. It's not safe. Supposing another thing were to come along. Oh, bother, Toad, said Rat savagely. I've done with him. They had not proceeded very far on their way, however, when there was a pattering of feet behind them, and Toad caught them up and thrust a paw inside the elbow of each of them, still breathing short and staring into vacancy. "'Now look here, Toad,' said Rat sharply. "'As soon as we get to the town, you'll have to go straight to the police station, "'see if they know anything about the motor car and who it belongs to, "'and lodge a complaint against it. "'Then you have to go to a blacksmith or a wheelwright "'and arrange for the cart to be fetched and mended and put to rights. "'It'll take time, but it's not quite a hopeless smash. "'Meanwhile, the Mole and I will go to an inn and find comfortable rooms "'where we can stay till the cart's ready, "'until your nerves have recovered their shock.' "'Police station?' Complaint, murmured Toad dreamily. Me complain of that beautiful, that heavenly vision that has been vouchsafed me. Mend the cart. I've done with carts forever. I never want to see the cart or hear of it again, oh ratty. You can't think how obliged I am to you for consenting to come on this trip. I wouldn't have gone without you, and then I might never have seen that, that swan, that sunbeam, that thunderbolt. I might never, might never have heard the trancing sound or smelt that bewitching smell. I owe it all to you, my best of friends. The rat turned from him in despair. You see what it is, he said to the mole, addressing him across Toad's head. He's quite hopeless. I give up. When we get to town, we'll go to the railway station, and with luck we may pick up a train there that'll get us back to the river bank tonight. And if you ever catch me going a pleasuring with this provoking animal again, he snorted, and during the rest of that weary trudge addressed his remarks exclusively to Mole. On reaching the town they went straight to the station and deposited Toad in his second class waiting room, giving a porter two tuppence to keep a strict eye on him. They then left the horse at the inn stable, then gave directions they could gave what directions they could about the cart and its contents. Eventually, a slow train, having landed them at the station not far from Toad Hall, they escorted the spe- Beg your pardon. Eventually, a slow train, having landed them at a station not far from Toad Hall, they escorted the spellbound, sleep-walking Toad to his door, put him inside, and instructed his housekeeper to feed him and undress him and put him to bed. Then they got out the boat from the boathouse, scored down the river home at a very late hour, and at a very late hour sat down to supper in their very own cosy riverside parlour, to Rat's great joy and contentment. The following evening, Mole, who had risen late and taken things very easy all day, was sitting on the bank fishing, when when the Rat, who had been looking up his friends and gossiping, came strolling along to find him. Heard the news, he said. There's nothing else being talked about all on the river bank. Toe went up to town by an early train this morning, and he's ordered a large and very expensive motor car. Well, one fad finished, and a motor car now. Who knows what Toad will get up to next. Um, just say quickly, thank you very much. I had a couple of pictures sent in uh, via the inquiries account yesterday. I'm afraid I can't name check you on this, but you know who you are, and thank you very much. That really made me very happy that you're enjoying these uh, broadcasts. Um, As always, I hope you're happy and safe and keep reading. Bye.